Good morning. It's lovely to see you all uh, this morning. Boy, haven't we had a, a lovely run of weather. It's been uh, beautiful out at Ardlethen. It's really nice we can be here together and share together, uh, sing and encourage one another and hear God's praises and also read the Bible and hear it proclaimed. Uh, please do stay for morning tea afterwards. Um, it's great time to have to continue the fellowship in the hall. Now, our family usually has a Bible time after dinner, and we read a bit of the Bible and chat about it. And, and lately, we've gone through Job. And as we were reading last night, I thought, wow, this is such a cool bit. I'm going to read it for the, uh, for the start of church this morning. So this is Job chapter 9. How can mere mortals prove their innocence before God? Though they wished to dispute with him, they could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who can resist him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He is the maker of the bear and the Orion, the Pallades and the constellations of the sky. He performs wonders that can't be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. He is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him that we might confront each other in court. If only there was someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. And isn't it amazing? We come this side of the cross where we do have a mediator and we can celebrate that not just this morning but during this week. Thank you for Jesus. Let's pray as we start. O oh God, you are sovereign. You are from everlasting to everlasting. You formed the stars. When you pass us, we cannot see you. Your wisdom is so profound and we are so foolish compared to you. You can speak to the sun and it won't shine. And if we speak, generally not a whole lot happens. Please forgive us for so often thinking more highly of us than we ought and thinking of you far more lowly than we ought. Please forgive us as a church for the so much sin we do, the things we do that we shouldn't do and the things that we should do that we don't do. Please help us not to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Please convict us of our sin that grieves you. Please forgive us for coveting, for wanting nice things that others have. Please forgive us when you have given us so much for being greedy for more, whether it's material, financial, food, or just other things. Please forgive us for wasting so much of the precious time you give us. Forgive us for not being disciplined in our use of time. Please forgive us for often forgetting the free gift of grace that you have given us and that we try to work out our salvation by our good works. Please have mercy on our country. Please uh, have mercy on our country for continuing to pursue wickedness instead of doing what's right. Thank you for Jesus, that he is the mediator between a perfect holy God as yourself and sinful wicked people as we are. Please have mercy on us. Thank you we can meet together now because of your mercy. Thank you we can sing, we can read, we can hear your word. Thank you that Derek can preach. Thank you for bringing them here to Tamora. As we hear your word, please change us. Please convict us. Please give us soft and humble hearts. And thank you we can talk to you in the gift of prayer through Jesus. And we ask all these things trusting in his merits alone. Amen. The first reading comes from 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, 
that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving Heavenly Father, you are our eternal rock, our, our God, our rock, our strength and refuge, our fortress and our shield, the one who is almighty and yet our Heavenly Father. We acknowledge you as the giver of all good gifts, especially the gifts of love as revealed in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We praise your holy name and marvel at what you have done for us. We humbly come before you in prayer. Draw us together, Father, in worship, service, outreach and fellowship. Although we do not deserve your goodness and we repeatedly fall short of the standards expected of us, we give thanks for your gracious provision of all our needs. Strengthen us, enable us to live by faith, a faith which works through love in Christ, love for God and our fellow man. We thank you for your word, the bread of life by which we are sustained, for the fellowship of prayer and the songs of praise which loosen our tongues to confess our faith in worship of you. We ask that you would be with those who cannot be with us today for whatever reason. We ask that your blessing rests upon them and that they might feel your presence. Father, we ask that you will watch over our loved ones away from home and over those embarked on travelling through this vast country of ours. Keep them safe from danger. Almighty God, strengthen those who sorrow and mourn the loss of a loved one. Make them look to Jesus Christ for encouragement and hope that through the scriptures and your promises they may place their trust in the God who raised him from the dead. <clears throat> Our Father which art in heaven, for you are the Father of all the people of the earth, and heaven is found wherever we feel the presence of your Spirit. Hallowed be your, your name. Let us keep your name holy through all our days. Your kingdom come. Teach us to live and work together as people of your kingdom. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Use us as your servants to carry out your plans. Give us this day our daily bread and use our hands to make and carry bread to all our hungry brothers. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Help us to forgive anyone who has wronged us before we ask you to forgive us for the wrongs we have done. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us put our trust in you so that we will not be tempted to do anything which would dishonour you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You are our maker, our ruler and our Lord. Amen. The second reading comes from Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 20 to 32. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, 
and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the offences they have committed will be remembered against them. Because of the righteous things they have done, they will live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? But if a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked person does, will they live? None of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness they are guilty of and because of the sins they have committed, they will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear, you Israelites, is my way unjust? Is it not your ways that are unjust? If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin, they will die for it. Because of the sin they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life. Because they consider all the offences they have committed and turn away from them, that person will surely live. They will not die. Yet the Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offences, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offences you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. It's good to see you all. Please do keep your Bibles open to Ezekiel. We're covering a huge chunk of Ezekiel today, chapters 12 to 24, and so that's kind of where we're, we're going to be. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us. We thank you for the book of Ezekiel. We thank you that even though there are parts of Ezekiel that are difficult and hard to understand, and it was written uh, such a long time ago in a different culture, we pray, Father, that we would know that your word is timeless and it speaks timeless truth. And so please help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, today we're looking at chapters 12 to 24, such a huge, massive chunk. How do we cover such large uh, territory in uh, such a short amount of time? I think the easiest way to move forward is to look at key themes in the uh, chapters that we're going to consider. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of key themes. And hopefully through looking at the themes, we get a better understanding of who God is, his desire for his people, and how we as God's people should respond to him. And so that's what we're doing. We're looking at key themes in the book of Ezekiel in chapters 12 to 24. So the first theme, jumping straight in, is the theme of leadership leadership leaders are important aren't they you have sports captains in the soccer teams in the nrl teams the footy teams the uh, well, whatever team it might be and you have coaches as well uh, that lead we have political leaders who make decisions that affect the whole nation and even on the school playground where there aren't appointed leaders there are students that do rise up to the occasion aren't they there are students that others look, uh, look to for influence and, uh, yeah, they look up to them. You see, leaders are important. But if you have bad leaders, that leads to bad outcomes for the people who are being led. Every now and then, uh, when you're watching the news, you'll uh, hear of political coups, won't you? Political corruption in leaders in all kinds of different countries around the world. And in the book of Ezekiel, time and time again, we see the failure of God's leaders. Sorry, Israel's leaders. We see the failure of Israel's leaders. In chapter 8, there's idolatry in the temple. 
In chapter 11, the leaders of Israel plot evil. In chapter 12, false prophets are condemned. In chapter 19, there's a lament over the princes of Israel. And so we see Israel's leaders get it wrong. It's a reminder for us. Leaders are important, but leaders get it wrong. So don't put your absolute trust, confidence, faith, hope in leaders. Instead, put your faith in God. And here's another thing we learn about leaders as well, since we're considering the theme of leadership. Who does God choose to lead? <coughs> in the book of Ezekiel, who does God choose to lead? He chooses Ezekiel, doesn't he? Ezekiel is not from some royal bloodline. He's a priest, sure. But there's nothing remarkable about Ezekiel. God chooses the ordinary to lead. God chooses the weak to shame the strong. God chooses the unremarkable to shame the wise. And who does God choose to send Ezekiel to? Who does God choose to send Ezekiel to? It's not the kings and princes in high power. God doesn't send Ezekiel to Jerusalem to speak to the kings. Instead, who does God send Ezekiel to? He sends Ezekiel to a bunch of randoms by the Kabar River in Babylon that no one knows about. And what does that tell us? It tells us that God doesn't show favoritism. God isn't only concerned about the kings and the princes, but the people by the Kabar River in Babylon in exile are just as important to God as the kings and the princes in Israel. Are leaders important? Yes, they're important. Are leaders more important than the people they lead? No, they're not. Leaders get it wrong. And so if you are a leader in your community, <coughs> I encourage you to steward the responsibility that God has entrusted to you well. Lead as Christ led in humility. Serve those you lead, model Christ, and look to Jesus, the servant king, as our true leader. That's the first theme, leadership. And connected very closely to this theme of leadership is, our second theme, the importance of discerning God's word the importance of discerning God's word. Let me read for us Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying now, saying to those who, sorry, say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit, and have seen nothing. Chapter 13, verse 10. Because they lead my people astray, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. I know we're studying Ezekiel, which some might not be comfortable with. And I know that I started the sermon series saying that Ezekiel's gift is not the gift of encouragement. Uh, he's not going to pat you on your back. And I did say that Ezekiel's role in the book of Ezekiel is a covenant prosecutor. His, his role is to defend, sorry, not defend, his role is to prosecute Israel in the law court of God. And sometimes people might not be comfortable with that, with the idea of judgment. But if every sermon we heard was God loves you and uh, God wants to bless you, and there was no mention of sin, no mention of judgment, no mention of a call to repent and believe, no mention of hell that awaits those who turn their back against God and reject Jesus as their Lord. Wouldn't that be leading people astray? Wouldn't that be saying to people, peace, peace, when there is no peace? The spiritual leaders of the day in Ezekiel, they got it wrong. And that tells us that even today, spiritual leaders can get it wrong. I can get it wrong. So how do you know if we're getting it wrong? How do you know that I'm not teaching false truth? Or how do you know that I'm teaching half-truths? The encouragement is to know the Word of God. Know the Bible. Know your scriptures. Don't assume that what spiritual leaders say is always the truth. Look at where that got Israel when they followed their spiritual leaders. And so I want to encourage all of us, read your Bibles. Keep your Bibles open. Meditate on it day and night. Let it shape your thoughts and actions. And so that's the second theme we see, the importance of the Word of God. 
The second theme we see is the danger of presuming on God's goodness. The danger of presuming on God's goodness. Does God have a moral duty and responsibility to make your life happy? Does God have a moral responsibility to bless your life the way you want him to? You see, Israel, they suddenly thought so. That's how they thought. Let me read for us. I know I said 12 to 24, but we're going to look at 11 because we uh, missed it a bit last week. Ezekiel 11, verse 2 to 3. The Lord said to me, Son of man, these are the men who are plotting evil and giving wicked advice in this city. They say, haven't our houses been recently rebuilt? This city is a pot and we are the meat in it. This city is a pot and we are the meat in it. What does that mean? A couple of weeks ago, I told you about a special dish called tonkotsu ramen. Has anyone tried tonkotsu ramen since then? <laughs> I shared about how it was made using pork trotter, the lovely pork trotter. And I'm sure you probably uh, got turned off tonkotsu ramen. <laughs> I'm guessing when you're cooking at home, you're not using the pork trotter, are you? You're not using chicken feet. You're not using uh, lamb's brains and uh, pork intestines. That's not what you're cooking with at home, is it? When you're cooking at home instead, what are you using? You know, probably the pork tenderloin, the chicken fillets, the beef um, sirloin, the scotch fillet, chuck steak, and so on. You're using the meat, aren't you? And you're chucking out all that other disgusting stuff. You see, Israel, what they were saying is, we're the meat. We are the A5 Wagyu steaks. We're not the pork trotter. We're not the uh, pig brain. We're on none of that. We're the meat. We're the meat in God's pot, which is Jerusalem. We are the people of God. We have the temple. We are the chosen ones. We're the descendants of Abraham. We have the law. God must love us. God must protect us. God wouldn't destroy us. We're the meat in the pot, which is God's uh, Jerusalem. But this is what God says. Verse 11. This city will not be a pot for you nor will you be the meat in it. I will execute judgment on you at the borders of Israel, and you will know that I am the Lord, for you have not followed my decrees or kept my laws, but have conformed to the standards of the nations around you. See, sadly, Israel presumed on God's goodness. They thought they were the A5 Wagyu, but instead they were the pork trotter. They were the ones disobeying God. They were the ones that had turned their back on him. You see, please don't presume on God's goodness. God doesn't owe us anything, but we owe God everything. Our time, our talents, our treasures, everything. You see, God could take it all away from us. He could take away our family. He could take away our friends. He could take away our farms. He could take away our money. He could take away all our superannuation balance. He could take away our houses and we would still be in debt to God. We would still owe God everything. He is God, and there is no other. And so as followers of Jesus, it's our joy and our delight to worship God, not so that we can get everything out of it, not for our benefit, but simply because God is God, and there is no other. The beauty of grace is that even though we don't deserve anything, Jesus gives us everything we need in him every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. A quote I came across the other day, which I thought was um, very yeah, striking to me, it said this. It said, if Jesus is all you have, you have all that you need. If Jesus is all you have, you have all you need. If Jesus is all that you have, you have all that you need. And that's true, isn't it? That's why Paul could say, I consider everything as loss compared to the surpassing knowledge and worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's why Paul could say, I consider everything rubbish. You see, Israel presumed on God. They took God for granted. They thought they must be the chosen people because they had this and that. But I want to encourage us, let's not take God for granted. Let's not presume on God's goodness. Let's take sin seriously. Let's repent of our sin and let's believe. The fourth theme we see <coughs> is a theme of unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness. We see this in chapters 16, uh, chapters 23, uh, but others as well. In chapter 15, Israel is described as a useless branch. 
In chapter 16, they're described as an adulterous wife, despite God's love for them. Ezekiel 16, let me read verse 15 to 16. But you, this is God speaking to uh, Jerusalem and Israel, but you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favours on anyone who passed by and your beauty became his. Verse 16, you took some of your garments to make gaudy high places where you carried on your prostitution. You went to him and he possessed your beauty. In chapter 23, Israel and Judah, they're described as adulterous sisters. You see, such graphic language to shock Israel into reality. I can't even begin to imagine the pain and the hurt that adultery and unfaithfulness would cause in a marriage. And God wants us to know that's the pain that he feels when his people turn their back on him, when his people commit spiritual adultery against him, unfaithfulness. Ephesians 4, 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed on the day of redemption. And so just, that's, it's just an encouragement for us to know our sin grieves God. Unfaithfulness to God grieves God. And so repent. Trust in him. That's the fourth theme, unfaithfulness. The fifth one is personal accountability for sin. Personal accountability for sin. And this is a particular focus on chapter 18 that Edwina read for us. Let me read Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. The one who sins is the one who dies. In chapter 18, God says a righteous person will live, but if that righteous person turns away from God, turns to sin, then he will die. And if that righteous person has a son who sins, will the sin live? No, he will die. But if that sinful person has a son, and that son repents of his sin, will that person die for his father's sin? The answer is no. The one who sins is the one who dies. Ezekiel 18, let me read verse 30. Therefore, you Israelites, I judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offences, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offences you have committed, and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. One thing that's fascinated me coming to Tamora is the, uh, the depth of knowledge that people have about their family history. Has anyone here done a research into family history, family trees? Yeah, there's been a number of books published, haven't there? Uh, but just slightly moving on to that, has anyone here then looked at their uh, family of origin and looked at how family of origin has influenced them? And it's, sli it's, very, it's slightly different to looking at family tree. This is more looking at intergenerational patterns of behavior and emotional uh, patterns that have affected people, that have been passed down from generation to generation. It's more about how intergenerational patterns of managing conflict, stress, and so forth have been passed down. Maybe some of us had parents who had a very bad temper, and that influenced us. That got passed down from generation to generation. It influenced us to have a short temper. Or maybe we're conflict avoiding now because of that. Or maybe addiction runs through our family tree. When we look at addiction as a theme, we can see how it's uh, been uh, so uh, prevalent. You see, Ezekiel reminds us that we can't blame others for our sin. If we sin, that's between us and God. We are responsible for ourselves to God. Standing before the throne of God, you'll be accountable to God for your ways and not someone else's ways. And sometimes, looking at intergenerational patterns, sometimes there can be dangers and temptations of blaming our parents or blaming our spouses or blaming our children for the way that we respond, uh, for the way that we uh, act out. But this passage tells us it's the one who sins who will die. And so don't blame others for your sin. They may have influenced you, but standing before the throne of God, you will be accountable to God for your sin, not for their sin. Or maybe you have been in conflict with someone. Maybe you had a deal with someone and it went pear-shaped and you're holding a lot of anger. How many generations are you going to hold it against them? 
Do you hold it against their children? Do you hold it against their children's children? Do you hold it against anyone that has that surname because of one conflict you had? Please don't. This passage tells us God doesn't hold future generations accountable for that person's sin. God holds each individual accountable for their own sin. And so that's the fifth theme, personal accountability for sin. And the last one that I want to touch on, really important one, is the theme of redemption. Redemption. Just as God acted out of grace to save Noah, just as God acted out of grace to call Abraham, just as God acted out of grace to make a nation for himself, he also acts out of grace to preserve a faithful remnant. Let me read a couple of passages. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 60. Yet I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth and I will establish you. Sorry, I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 41. I will accept you as a fragrant incense when I bring you out from the nations and gather you from other countries where you have been scattered. And I will be proved holy through you in the sight of the nations. You see, notice in those passages I read, it's God acting. It's not God saying, clean up your life and get your mess sorted out, then I will love you. God is saying, actually, I am going to act. I am going to save you. I am going to work in you. And the beauty of the gospel is that it's not about us. The beauty of the gospel is that it's all about God. God doesn't save his people for the sake of his people. If you read Ezekiel, another theme that comes out is he saves people for the sake of his name. For the sake of his holy name, he saves people. That means it doesn't depend on us. If we fail, God's not going to withhold his love because his love doesn't depend on us in the first place. He keeps his promise. And that means another weight is lifted off our shoulders. We don't have to earn God's love. Instead, all we have to do is accept it with gratitude. And that's what we see at the cross, isn't it? God acts out of grace to save his people from their sin. When we trust in Jesus, we receive new hearts. We're set free from slavery to sin. We're born again. We receive new life. Our eyes are opened to walk in the light. Everlasting joy, everlasting hope, everlasting peace. Is it because of how great we are? Is it because of how righteous we are? Is it because of how much God needs us? No, <laughs> of course not. We got nothing. We got nothing that God needs from us. It's all because of how great God is. And so we've covered a lot of themes today, covered a lot of area and content. But my hope is that through it, God has spoken, he's encouraged you from the book of Ezekiel, and he's reminded you of his goodness. And so flee from sin. Cling to God's grace and know that salvation is found at the foot of the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you love us. We pray that you would be with our leaders, our leaders in our nation. We pray in particular you would be with our spiritual leaders, that they would dwell on your word. We pray, Father, that we would repent of our sin and not blame others for the sin in our lives. Thank you that you work to save us, not because of how great we are, but because of how great you are. And so help us cling to Christ, seek you in your word, and know the goodness of the gospel. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.